Welcome to this module within the Policy Development course. This module is titled Parts of a Policy, Procedures, and Guidelines. I'm Bonnie McEwen, consultant for the Northwest District Office of the State Library. You're welcome to contact me with any questions following this class. You can refer back to this slide for my information, or you can find me in the Contact Us link on the State Library's website. In the first policy module, we looked at the need for libraries to develop policies along with the role that the library boards and directors play in that process. In the second module, I introduced Policies for Results, a book from the Public Library Association. We looked in detail at the first two parts of a policy, philosophy and regulations. In this module, I'll explain the remaining two parts of the policy procedures, and guidelines. This slide points to some convincing reasons behind the need for library policies. I'll refer you back to the first module for a more detailed discussion about these reasons. For now, a recap of an important standard connected to policy development. And that's standard number seven which requires at a tier one level that libraries adopt policies for required written policies, circulation, collections, personnel, and internet use. Standard number seven and over 80 more are found in the publication showing here, In Service to Iowa Public Library Standards. This is a publication from the State Library and an important resource for library boards, directors, and staff to know about. There are lots of potential subtopics within the broader category of a circulation policy. Many of them you see on this slide. Interlibrary loan is highlighted here because like last time, I'm going to use interlibrary loan as a way to apply the ideas from policies for results. We've established that library boards have a great deal of authority over library operations, including developing policy. But it's also true that the work of writing policies is collaborative work. It also involves the library director and the staff. This chart is a good summary of the role of the director, board, and staff in policy development. The second policy module focused on the board's role, but today this third module focuses on the staff role. Last time I introduced Policies for Results, a book from the Public Library Association. It's not a new book from PLA, but I find the ideas in it to be evergreen. Philosophy and regulations are both within the purview of the library board to approve. Again, refer back to module two for a detailed explanation of philosophy and regulations. Today though, it's about procedures, those things that the staff needs to do. Procedures are staff work routines. And today it's also about guidelines. Think of guidelines as best practice, the allowance to make exceptions to the rules for good reason, for good customer service reasons. Like we did last time with policies for results as the backdrop and interlibrary loan as the example, let's turn to procedures and guidelines. I believe that there are two terms, regulations and procedures that are often used interchangeably, but they really are different. And I want to make that distinction between the two. Regulations are those things that library users need to know in order to use library service to best advantage. Procedures are those things that library staff need to do staff work routines in order for staff to deliver library services effectively and efficiently. Procedures are detailed in writing. They often require step-by-step -step instructions for staff to follow. 
And one of the most significant things about procedures is that library management and staff can figure them out. These are staff work routines, again, often requiring a step-by-step -step instruction. So the board doesn't need to weigh in on this level of work. These are things for the staff to figure out and things that the board needs to trust. When boards become too involved in procedures, then they also become much too involved in micromanagement. So to our interlibrary loan example, Here are some very common procedures surrounding interlibrary loan. These are work routines that staff will do every business day. For instance, a patron asks to borrow a book that he doesn't find in your library's collection. Your first step is to verify that by searching your local catalog. And if you really don't own the item, then the second search strategy is to look for it in the silo catalog. And if it's found in silo, then you can place a request for this book as a borrowing library. If the item is not found in silo, you can still request to borrow it. But in this case, then, you'll need to fill out a form on the State Library's website. That form will drop to your district office to process. And the last point on the slide is something we encourage all libraries to do, and that is to log into your silo account every business day to check on the status of the books that you've borrowed from others, as well as to check on the status of the books that your library is lending to others. You probably follow these and other procedures at your library in providing interlibrary loan service. Let's look at the fourth part of a policy then, the guidelines. Along with the philosophy statement, I'll wager that this fourth part of a policy is rarely found in writing. It rarely shows up in writing. It shows up in behavior, but they're seldom written down. Like, unlike regulations, which really are intended to be rules that are intended to be followed, think of guidelines as best practice. Think of guidelines as the ask. What do we ask of people? in terms of personal responsibility. Here's an example. You're in a movie theater. <clears throat> the previews are winding up and this message comes up on screen. We thank you for silencing your phones. Enjoy the show. Well, no one comes down the aisle of the theater to confiscate your phones and you're not required to drop off your phone at the popcorn counter before going into the theater. A guideline is what we ask of people using public spaces. So as I said, best practice does show up, but it shows up in the doing in staff behavior and in customer service. It shows up in meeting and greeting and assisting people who use the library and all it offers. What if these kinds of best practices were actually written down more consistently so that all staff could see them and adapt these best practices when similar situations come up? to our interlibrary loan example. Here are some suggestions for guidelines surrounding interlibrary loan. All staff will be trained in interlibrary loan procedures and able to provide that service during all library hours. That's a great guideline because it speaks so well about good customer service. Staff will use the Iowa Shares Van Delivery Service 
as frequently, as consistently as possible. And staff will continually develop and encourage new approaches to providing interlibrary loan service, finding new techniques. You can probably think of other best practice guidelines that you are already using at your library when providing interlibrary loan. One of the best ways to update job descriptions is to ask the person doing the job. Ask for that input, that firsthand knowledge from the person who is doing the job. Well, the same concept applies here. Staff should feel that they are free to make suggestions and offer input at any step along the way. Staff certainly should understand the process and respect the various roles that the board and the director play. But frontline staff are referred to that way for good reason. They are the ones on the front lines. They are the ones on the service desks interacting with patrons every day. They hear about patron frustrations. If people are frustrated by rules and regulations that feel burdensome or illogical. So staff really should bring those encounters up for discussion and make suggestions for improvement. And then understand that many times rules need to be followed and for good reasons. So staff need to be able to explain policy regulations and implement them as fairly and as consistently as possible. A frequent question that comes from hearing about policies for results in the four parts of a policy is this question, should staff procedures be pulled out from the rest of the policy handbook and kept separately? And for me, my answer to that question is yes. I think so. I think it's more convenient and it's more logical to have a procedures manual readily accessible for the staff filed apart from the formal policy philosophy and regulations that the board approves. Because procedures are staff work routines, they should be kept where staff can easily find them. Filing procedures in a three ring binder is fine. It's pretty typical actually, but as more and more things in our lives are saved to the cloud, you might want to consider using cloud-based products like Google Docs or Microsoft OneNote or even Live Binders. Live Binders is a website that allows you to create digital binders with the same look and feel of the familiar three ring binders that we all have sitting on our shelves. Easy to access, easy to share, and easy to update your live binders from anywhere. To help reinforce these ideas, let's set aside interlibrary loan and look at, a, look at a few other policy topics that are also good examples of procedures and guidelines. While this example is not associated with a specific library, it is a good example of procedures associated with an internet policy. So for instance, staff will record daily internet uses and then dispose of the daily sign-in sheets at the end of every business day. Staff will announce that the library is closing 15 minutes prior to closing to ensure that internet users can finish up. And staff will maintain current fact sheets and navigation guides and display holders next to all public computers. No doubt you can think of other staff work routines connected to people using the library's public computers. This is a nice example from Atlantic Public Library. Here Atlantic has identified some guidelines surrounding their circulation policy. You can see how these guidelines speak to best practice. For instance, staff can change the due date for the following reasons. If patrons are not able to make it in due to bad weather, if patrons have been sick or in the hospital and unable to make contact with the library, 
If a patron has lost an item and has acknowledged that but would like a little extra time to look for it, or maybe a patron has returned an item but with a missing piece or two, you can see how these guidelines from Atlantic Public Library connected with their circulation policy sets up some very good customer service exceptions to the rules. Best practice behavior. This example from Urbandale Public Library, I like very much because this strikes me as a guideline behind Urbandale's meeting room policy. Urbandale is big enough to have a couple of public meeting rooms that subdivide. What's circled on the slide here takes people to photos of how the meeting room could be set up. So because guidelines speak to best practice, what a nice practice this is. This provides that extra layer of information for people who are visiting the Urbandale Library website looking to reserve a meeting room and they can determine what rooms are available. They're able to determine the size of the room and the potential room arrangements. Best practice guidelines. One of my favorite policy related articles you can find on Web Junction, the link at the bottom of the slide takes you there. It dates from 2013 from a webinar sponsored by Web Junction titled Extreme Customer Service Every Time. Sarah Gillis with the Halifax Library System in Canada talked about conducting a staff project for the staff to help identify those rules that actually resulted in barriers to good customer service. Too many regulations, rules that were too restrictive became barriers to good service. Sarah Gillis then went on to write the article referenced here on the slide, today I bent a rule explaining the library's staff driven project and their approach to providing more responsive customer service by favoring more best practice guidelines. If we were together in person, I'd love to hear what you think about policies for results and the four parts of a policy. As you think about using these ideas at your library, let me offer this. I am not suggesting that you tear apart your policy manual and start over. But I am suggesting that when it's time to review a policy category like circulation or collections, at the point when you're revising a policy topic, then at that point, try formatting that policy according to the four parts. Don't forget, to share these ideas with your board and with your staff, and then take a crack at it. This concludes this module within the policies course, parts of a policy, procedures, and guidelines. Be sure to reach out to us at the State Library with any questions.